We'll begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son and pouring out your Holy Spirit, especially uh, to, to give us the, the Spirit's gift of joy. Help us uh, to uh, rejoice with those who said, uh, let us go to the house of the Lord. Uh, fill us with uh, the, the joy that only comes uh, from the Holy Spirit, uh, who brings us uh, to the knowledge of your love for us in Jesus, your Son. In his name we pray. Amen. Page 17, a little bit from Ecclesiastes 3 first. For everything there is an appointed time. There is an appropriate time for every activity under heaven. A time to mourn and a time to dance. The heart dances. It dances awkwardly alone in front of a mirror. It dances awkwardly alone in a crowd of fellow met middle schoolers. It dances to fit in, unsure of its preteen self. It hopes to be noticed, but not by just anyone. It wants the cool kids to notice, to give an approving nod, a freeze frame worthy thumbs up. It dances to be seen, to be loved, to be accepted. The heart can dance to escape, to forget, to indulge. It dances in rhythm with the ever-changing tune of emotion. It dances back and forth like a wave tossed on the sea. The heart dances to belong. It tries to learn the dance of the people to whom it wants to belong. If it is the self-made millionaires, the heart will buy their books and gorge itself on their social media output. If it is the super dads, the heart will even pressure his kids into becoming trophies of his super daddom. A crowd is a peculiar thing. You can be with and alone, surrounded and separated, connected but never connecting. The heart longs to dance with another but is often chasing crowds that are not worth chasing. The heart must be made new. Its dance brought in step with the body of Christ, the church. The new heart rejoices with those who said, let us go to the house of the Lord. This crowd is not an anonymous crowd. It is not bound together by the downbeat that drives a rave. Being in this crowd is not performance-based. You do not have to dance well enough, like the pressure on the preteen before the first ever middle school dance. You do not have to make enough, like the pressure on the young breadwinner. You do not have to be super dad enough. The church is bound together by the grace of Christ. Undeserved love brings you into this body. Undeserved love is how we get to view each other. That person in the pew over there is one you get to rejoice with, or mourn with, or anything in between with. That person is not someone you have to impress or need to avoid because they are depressing. The heart dances well when it denies itself, when there is a holy forgetfulness of self. No one who is obsessed with how they look while dancing will ever dance well. But lost in the music, even the worst dancer dances well. When you forget you, when you forget you and consider your joy, then you rejoice with the throng of people who love to go to the house of the Lord. Whoever they are, however much of a mess they are and you are, we rejoice to go together to meet Jesus, who pours out his cleansing blood on us, a whole mess of sinful dancing tax collectors and prostitutes. You don't have to be like some preteens at middle school dance, judging who deserves, deserves to fit in with whom. You and people who you would have no earthly business hanging out with both fit in with Jesus because you and they and I are all sinners. This is the good news that makes the heart forget itself 
and dance well. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. It seems like a sour note, but it's a spark of joy, right? Because Jesus came to save sinners. If I'm the worst, okay. Uh, then I uh, don't have to waste my time looking down on the people around me because they don't seem to fit in uh, the proper way. Um, they and I and you, we all fit in with Jesus because we're sinners. And that's why we come to the divine service on Sunday morning. That's it. That's the thing. We're sinners, and he is pouring out forgiveness on us. Uh, and when we've got that mindset, uh, then we get to rejoice. So what if I uh, come across someone who has maybe lied about me in the past? There's blood for them. Same blood that's there for me. Um, when it's all about grace... Uh, then I can be filled with joy, and my joy doesn't need to be hampered by, you know, being like the mean girls at, uh, in middle school, um, nasty and judging and uh, looking down on others. Huh. I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Let's go. I want to read from Philippians, from Romans, and then again from Philippians. And I want you to think about this question, uh, number one, which has a few parts to it. How do these passages help your heart dance when nothing is going your way, when you are depressed, or when you have good to do that you don't want to do? Understand what I mean by that? Good to do that I don't want to do? Sure. Take the trash out. <laughs> um, Call someone. Uncomfortable conversations with people sometimes, uh, giving someone a phone call when you know it's not going to be just a nice, pleasant thing. you got to say some tough stuff. No, I or, was thinking of what you mentioned this week. You know, call those who you know are lonely. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't want it sometimes, but guess what? It's good, yeah, and they need it, and I need it. I need to do, and mm -hmm. you know what? That's often what happens is you don't want to do it, but when you've done it, you've been blessed more than the other person was. Yes. Just, just to do it. Yeah. So they're talking about... Um, Go call your elders and check in on them. Ask for wisdom. Say things like, you know, if, if I'm, I'm not 20 right now, but if I was 20-something, uh, call someone who's 70-something and say, hey, what do you wish you didn't do when you were 20? So that you don't, you know, share those kinds of regrets. I mean, that, that's from, that's all, that's all over Proverbs, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so it's a wise thing to go out of your way, and and if someone is, if someone's in their 80s, and they might be living alone, and they might really welcome a random phone call from you just to check in. And that might be intimidating, especially if you're my age and younger. We're we didn't we're not as comfortable talking on the phone. <laughs> it's it's awkward. Uh, we we don't like it, but. It's a good thing that does me good, does them good. Uh, so good good that you know you have to do, but you don't want to do. So with those questions in mind, I'm going to read from Philippians chapter 2. We'll jump back to Romans 8 and then back to Philippians 4. The Philippians 2 verses 1 through 11. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself 
and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Romans chapter 8, the whole chapter is amazing, here just at the end. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Finally, back to Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the, peace of, and the God of peace will be with you. Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So how do these passages help your heart dance when nothing is going your way? Or when you are depressed? Or when you have good to do that you don't want to do? Pick no. up on any of those. Go ahead, John. Don't just think about yourself. I mean, that's what all of you have to deal with. It's not just about you. If you engulf yourself with others around you and their happiness, that could lift yourself up as well. Okay, so if I'm... Uh, if I'm stuck, uh, here's me, if I'm stuck, turned in on myself, uh, I'm going to be thinking about my situation, uh, what's going on here, the anxieties of life are going to just grow, 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 how could there be any joy? Uh, if instead I get turned outside uh, to, to especially uh, Christ Jesus on the cross for me. I can think about him, and I can think about the whole body of Christ, the, the church. Uh, then I can surround myself with songs of joy and deliverance. So if my attitude becomes like his uh, in Philippians 2, same mind as Christ, same attitude as Christ, who emptied himself, I know that what I'm going to go through is not going to be this bad. And I know that he's going to be with me, whatever it is that I'm going to go through. So there's good I got to do that I don't want to do. If there's any other way, let this cup be taken from me, Jesus prayed. He knows what it is to the point of blood coming out like sweat as he's praying about the good that he's got to do, but he doesn't. It's tough. This is the one who has been through it, and this is the one who will be with you through it. If it's just me, if I'm curved in here, I'm not going to be able to get through it. Turn myself out, think about others, think about Christ who took all of us into himself uh, and thinking about the body of Christ. There's joy, there's support, um, and motivation. Stand up straight, stop looking in, get out there, go. Other thoughts? How do these verses kind of help you dance, even if 
this is what's before you to be like Christ and to bear a cross. Well, just like John said, and you were there too, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also the interests of others, and your attitude should be like the same of Christ Jesus. Um, you know, that's removing you from looking. If, if we take on the attitude of Christ, we're, we're serving others. We're being a servant as he came to serve, and uh, that will always be a blessing to our hearts. And help our heart to dance. Yeah, and what you mentioned before. Yeah. When you when you go when when you go out of your way to, to uh, reach you out to somebody, yeah, you, you end up getting so much more out of it. Uh, you usually say. And I had it once told to me, you know, even with teaching Bible school or vacation Bible school or Sunday school, you know, the teacher always learns more than yeah. the students. Yeah. So that's excellent too. Yeah. So when, yeah, when you're serving someone else, it's not like this is going to harm you. Even if you're bearing, bearing a cross in love for another, this is going to be good for you too. It might be a, a Good Friday kind of good and, and hurt, <laughs> but... Was it last week or the week before we were in Romans 5? And what does suffering produce? Perseverance. Perseverance and perseverance produces hope and well, character. Character and character, hope, and hope does not disappoint. Um, this is it's good. It gets you outside of yourself. What's the worst that can happen? Look at uh, that Romans 8. The absolute worst thing that could happen in all of existence is if you're outside of Christ and he says, I know I never knew you, depart from me into the darkness. But we've got this comfort in Romans 8. Nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. All of these lists of terrifying things that we might think could, not this, not this, not this, not this, nothing will separate. So if the worst thing that could possibly happen, we have this comfort in Romans 8 that it's not going to happen. Nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Okay. I can be bold and I can do these things. Because I got this promise. When I'm depressed... I've got this promise... Nothing's going to separate me from Jesus. This depression, this uh, weighty sort of sadness that keeps me from getting out of bed, maybe. It doesn't keep me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. I may struggle with this depression until I die. Anxiety might be something that's that's a that's a, a, a close companion, not a good friend, but always there in this life. But this does not separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Go into the sermon this morning. That doesn't mean that our feelings, our emotions are going to be exactly as we want them to be. It's going to be a roller coaster. It's going to be a mess. But we won't be separated from the love of God in Christ. As we look outside of ourselves to Christ uh, and to promises like you have in the, that beautiful chapter of Romans 8. We just had the end of it, but so much more before that. Comfort, 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 promise, promise, promise. And, and it gets me standing up straight and looking out away from my heart and to his promises. And the heart might still be sad. There might be clinical depression. Might be at a point where, thank God for medication that I might need. Things like that. But this love is not going to change. Well, and thankful that there's not an if. Yeah. <laughs> From this. Yeah. yeah. No if. 
Glad you're awake. <laughs> um, so thinking about others gets us into 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If you were bouncing around in Romans or Philippians, it's in between Romans and Philippians. 1 Corinthians would be right after Romans. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There, take a look at more than half, but starting at verse 12, in the last two-thirds of that chapter, talking about the body of Christ, many parts, one body. Scan over that a little bit. I'll give you some quiet. Take a look at that. You look. I'll drink coffee. And think about this question. The church is against bodily segregation. Why do eyes need feet? Spent a number of months with 1 Corinthians last year, starting in, I think, January it was, and going quite a ways. I'm trying to remember that far back. I can't, but we did uh, take some time with uh, this chapter, especially. One body, many members. The church is against bodily segregation. Why do eyes need feet? Taken where, where you're looking um, in that way. If well, this morning I was walking around in the dark in our house, the family room was like not cluttered with toys. It was a clean family room. There was one, and I found it <laughs> with my toe. Ouch. I didn't see it. Ouch. Um, made a big noise while everyone was sleeping. Um, if I can't see where I'm going, my feet don't have eyes. My feet need to. How, feet How does that work? <laughs> yeah, that, that would be that would be uncomfortable. Um, how does that work within the body of Christ? You are all different members of this one body of Christ. Why do you need each other? Because each one has a specific gift, and all need to work together to produce the final end result. And you can't, everybody can't do the same thing. Absolutely. We, we all have different gifts. We all have the, the Spirit's uh, gifts of, of things like patience and kindness and gentleness. But we all have each of those in, a, in different measure. And then uh, Paul talks about uh, being able to teach, talks about uh, being merciful, talks about uh, gratitude uh, and generosity, things like that. You all excel at different things in different levels. And that makes the, the body of Christ this beautiful thing where you have these differences and you're able to accomplish so much more because of those differences. What we don't want is what happens a little bit with different denominations that you have certain skills a little bit more in different denominations and there's separation for good reason 
but do what what do we what do we miss out on because we don't excel at certain gifts that others have and you you see that when you look at from denomination to denomination uh, they, they're really good at this we're, we're b way better at that but because of this necessary separation that we have how can how can you grow from that without pretending like there shouldn't be a separation, which there should be. It's tough. That's why we say we believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. We, we don't see it. What we see is a mess and splintered, and we see that within from congregation to congregation, infighting and nastiness that's just not helpful. But when you see it working together, like a body, doesn't get much more beautiful than that within the body of Christ, each member making use of their gifts. The building up of the body. We need each other. I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful that you have each other. And that's a, a good prayer to fight against the sinful nature, to pray for ingratitude for all of the other people around. I've been rereading Grace Upon Grace by John Kleinig. I mentioned this in Wednesday morning Bible class. And he has a suggestion for the way that he prays for others when he goes to church. The four things that he does. At first, when he enters the church, he prays for everyone who he knows is serving. Musicians, people handing out uh, bulletins, a preacher, everyone that he knows is serving. As he enters the church, he says a prayer specifically for them. When he goes to communion, he brings people in prayer with him up to communion who can't be there. Whether they're shut in, outside of the congregation, and, and not in our fellowship, or uh, outside of the Christian church entirely, he'll pray for someone that can't be shoulder to shoulder with him as part of that, which which reminds me that uh, I should slow down at communion. There's never enough time for you up there. Um, there's so much to pray about, so many people to pray for. Um, ought not to be rushed. Then he says he rarely ever sings the distribution hymns. But instead, as each person goes up, he prays specifically for them. That's that's the one that I that came to mind this morning. Uh, as what we're, we're, we're just talking about here. Make that a habit from time to time to thank God for the people that you see up there, the people that you see in the pew around you. Say a specific prayer of gratitude that God has given you that person and think about them. Think about the gifts that they have, how that might uh, benefit you, how you might benefit them with your gifts. This morning we didn't sing distribution hymns, so this would that would have been a, a good good morning for that. But if you do love singing distribution hymns, you maybe sing the odd verses, even verses, pray for people, odd verses, sing back and forth. Uh, find time to whether it's during communion or not. Find time to thank God specifically for everyone else within the congregation. God has given you each other. God knew what he was doing when he gave you each other. In what way can you thank God for them? The fourth of, of those, since I said there was four, this other one's not connected, but any distraction he takes as a reason to pray. The, the old sinful nature will take a distraction as a reason to grumble, um, but the new man, the new heart, can take every distraction as a reason to pray. So there's construction going on across the street, maybe, and that a uh, siren, a I've siren, heard siren yeah, before. yeah, often on their way to crown care. Um, and if that happens in the middle of the silence during the service, my old sinful nature might say, Oh, what terrible grumble! You know, I might get angry about that, about the construction, about the bird hitting the window or something, you know, or the kids being loud. My old sinful nature will complain. The new heart can take it all as a reason for gratitude instead of grumbling. And I can pray for those people uh, that distracted me. 
rather than grumble about those people that distract me. <coughs> that's, a, that's part of this fight, old heart, new heart. Uh, the new heart can always be grateful where the old heart wants to grumble. And so if you find yourself grumbling, you're probably missing a chance to be grateful in prayer and to thank God for something. It's a, it's a good way of testing yourself. Which heart, the old heart or the new heart, is in control at this moment? Uh, am I grumbling? I'm missing a chance to prayer, to, to pray and to be grateful. That's a tough one, because I'd rather grumble. It's fun. <laughs> it's not good, though. It's not helpful. Okay. Praying for each other. Anything else on the body of Christ? It's like a team. Yeah. Well-oiled machine. Well-oiled machine. The team, uh, this this body works well together when uh, all, every part. And think about if, um, not because it's running into that toe, it was something yesterday, something with my foot wasn't going well. And so you change the way that you walk, and that impacts everything else, uh, right? Uh, if I end up having to walk like this, how's my back going to be feeling? And, you know, just the way the, the bad ripple effect, the bad dominoes uh, that happens there. Uh, where if one thing's not working well, everything else is going to get harmed in some way. Yeah, or they have to pick up the slack if they're, they're slacking. you got to pick up the slack, yeah. Okay, page 19, real quick, or with the uh, 10 minutes we got. Tolling and taxiing. The church bells toll to announce certain things. They told to announce the beginning of the service. They told to announce the praying of the Lord's Prayer, once at the beginning, once at the end, <coughs> once at the end. They told at the words of Christ, this is my body, this is my blood. They told to announce and invite. If you are out in the field chasing down the cows and can't be at the divine service, the tolling of the bell at the Lord's Prayer invites you to stop a moment and pray with even out alone among the cows, to pray with the people of God, our Father who art in heaven. That was one of the purposes of the church bells. Um, beginning of the service, during the Lord's Prayer, uh, during the words of institution, uh, various times in each church uh, having some of its own um, unique traditions with that. But that's mostly the, the times when the church would, uh, bell would be ringing. So if you couldn't be at church and you heard uh, the bells that you know single, uh, Our Father, who art in heaven, whatever had kept you away, chasing down the cows, it might be, you knew everyone else in that church building is saying, Our Father, who art in heaven. And so it hurts that you can't be there because you rejoice with those who said, Let us go to the house of the Lord. But you hear the bell and you can stop. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And you time it, I don't know where which petition, the middle one, but it would, at the beginning of Lord's Prayer, in the middle, and then at the end. Uh, so give us this day our daily bread. If you were a little behind, speed up a little bit, <laughs> uh, get, in, get in line with them. Um, and that's part of the, 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 the purpose of church bells, inviting uh, in this way. Now, bells don't really serve that purpose as often anymore. Um, don't even exist uh, very often anymore. Uh, but you can serve that purpose. You can be church bells. You can call friends and family and say what sparks joy in the new heart. Let us go to the house of the Lord. You can ask, do you need a ride? Can I pick you up? As the church bells toll and have brought people to their knees in worship and prayer, even out among the cows, you can taxi people to church in your car, or at least in your heart, which we mentioned before with uh, going up to communion and for people who can't be there for whatever reason. Um, you hear, have you heard about that? Church bell traditions? There's a lot of neat things. No. Um, it's not as common anymore, uh, well, but it's really cool stuff. It's a good day to hear the Methodist church or the Catholic church bells. Yeah, yeah. Various hours uh, throughout the day, marking the day, um, reminders to pray. Uh, not just on Sunday morning, but all throughout the week. Did you have something? Okay. I thought you were going to say something. Sorry, Dottie. <laughs> oh, well, I was just thinking about Germany. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Some in some churches. It's basically uh, Catholic, so. In New Ulm, Minnesota, where our uh, our synods teacher and pastor training college is, they have a Glockenspiel. Yeah. Uh, town. Uh, it's a really neat neat deal, and um, and they can be pretty ornate and uh, all sorts of things like that, but. But you get to be church bells. The main uh, reason for church bells is inviting people to worship. Uh, and you can do the same. Uh, you can ding-dong your way out there and um, invite people into the good stuff. We have five minutes left, but not enough to get into our next section. The next section is the heart hides. This will be the first part of the divine service. So everything so far has been introductory. Uh, this will be when we look at when the pastor says, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, this will be a very short look at that short part of the service. But that part of the service is deeper than the ocean. The amount of grace and comfort that you can find just in that part of the service to the point where if you if you come to church and after you sing amen or say amen to the pastor saying in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then you get a text about some emergency, cows are out and you gotta go, whatever. You you were fed that morning. If you even if that's the only part of the service that you got to be at. There is so much there. And it falls well, we'll be looking at that next week, which is Trinity Sunday, and we'll be looking at this holy name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and uh, what is all tied into that part of the service. I'm looking forward to looking at that with you next week, and thinking about it especially under the idea of hiding. Let that whet your appetite a little bit. How is the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what does that have to do with hiding? Thoughts, questions at all with, before we close with the prayer? I was going to ask Peter in the, the one reading where he says, For the Father is greater than I. Part of the That's mystery of the Trinity. Evil. It's part of the mystery of the Trinity. So uh, in John 14, this Holy Thursday, Jesus talks about the Father as greater than I. I thought they were equal. We'll confess that next week as we look at the mystery of the Trinity, that the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, yet they are not three gods. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father. They are co-equal in majesty, is one of the things that we'll say in the Athanasian Creed. When Jesus is speaking, in John 14, this is, he's in his state of humiliation. So for a time, he did not make full use of his divine power, glory, and authority. So his glory that he has with the Father and has had with the Father since before time existed is he's co-equal in that glory. But for a time, he doesn't make full use of that so that he can lower himself like we looked at in Philippians 2, emptying himself. He still has that glory, but he's not using it. So that would be when the Father would be greater, so to speak. So he can say, the Father is greater than I. Yeah. He can say, only the Father knows the last day of the world. I don't know, because he's not using that, that power, glory, and authority. But there's also a sense in which the Son is always the Father's Son. And though they are co-equal in glory and majesty, he comes from the Father, the eternally begotten of the Father, to get some Christmas stuff in there. Um, it would be very Yeah. I mean, hardly understandable. We'll get it all. We'll get it all understood. Understood next week okay. uh, in the Holy Trinity. We'll get it. You'll, yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, we we were talking about that in uh, our last pastors circuit meeting, and preaching on the Trinity, which is next Sunday, Trinity Sunday, and the temptation to try to 
answer what we can't answer. And hopefully I won't fall into that temptation next week and try to answer some things because the Trinity is a mystery. It's beyond us. How is it that the Son can say that the Father is greater than I? Get a little bit of that and understanding that during his time of humiliation, he's not making full use of his glory the way that I may not make full use of my power in wrestling with my boys so that they pin me and they win. I lose for their sake. I don't use what I have. This is what Jesus is doing. He's not using what he has as he's put under the law. Uh, and, and that he was able to die. And that he's able to die. That, yeah. No, God can't die. No. Jesus is God. But that's... That's that second part of the Athanasian yeah, Creed okay. and the mystery of who Jesus is, too, as true God and true man. And what we call the, the communication of attributes. That what God can't do, but man can, like man can die, that attribute is communicated to, the, to this one person, Christ, who is God and man. And... Um, pause before I say things the, the wrong way because it's it's like a piece of iron that cannot give light and cannot give heat but has been put into the burning hot embers white hot the attribute of the fire has been communicated to the iron so that now it gives light gives heat can burn. That's one of the illustrations from the early Christian church and trying to teach how is it that this man who has died is God? Um, how can he perform what he did? Yeah, we won't have it all fixed next Sunday. We, we just get to marvel at uh, the triune God next Sunday. But that's, that's a fitting question for what we're doing next week. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much, and have a...